Welcome to our session this morning, Pitch Side, looking at the impact of the Women's Euros in Sheffield. My name is Fran Stobold, and I'm going to be sat in the background today doing a little bit of um, tech and admin for the session. So I thought I'd do a really quick welcome, just talk about the tech before I hand it over to Verity, who's going to chair the session and introduce our panellists. Um, so we're running on Zoom today. If anybody has any difficulties with their Zoom and they drop out of the session, um, please just log in using the same um, logins that you used initially. If the session, um, if the tech fails at our end, I will contact everybody and let you know whether we can get back up and running within our hours time frame or whether we need to reschedule. We are recording the session, so it's completely up to you whether you'd like to keep your cameras on or off, whatever you're most comfortable with. And there are closed captions enabled for this session, which you can toggle on and off using your own Zoom control. Um, I think that's everything that I need to say. Um, Verity, I shall hand over to you. Thank you very much, Fran. Um, welcome everybody to um, this webinar. So it's pitch side, the impact of um, the women's Euros in Sheffield. Um, so I'm Verity Smith. I'm an associate consultant uh, for Sporting Heritage. And Sporting Heritage has worked on a number of different programmes connected to the Women's Euros 2022, which, as you know, is taking place during this month, July, across right across England. And um, we're really delighted um, that we've been involved in the activity. Um, one of the um, programmes is to support the delivery of heritage activity for the hosts in Sheffield. Um, so we've got some speakers um, that work in Sheffield and can talk about Sheffield during this webinar. Um, and the heritage activity has been kind of funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, and this webinar is um, part of that. So today I'm chairing a webinar with our panel of four speakers. Um, Dr John Wilson, who's a lecturer in the Management School at the University of Sheffield. We have Sarah Harnett, who's the Women's Recreational Football Officer at Sheffield and Hallam County Football Association. Um, Gail Newsom, who played for Preston WFC in the 1970s. And she's also researched the Ditka ladies team and helped get Lily Parr inducted as the first female player in the National Football Museum's Hall of Fame back in 2002. And finally, we have Beth Fielding Lloyd, who's principal lecturer in the Academy of Sport and Physical Activity at Sheffield Hallam University. So thank you very much to all of you and welcome to all of you this morning. Um, before we um, continue with the conversation, I'm just going to ask um, Fran to show a short video of, from the roadshow in Sheffield um, that kicked off in May. We're really, really hoping, you know, fingers crossed, that the Lionesses make it to the semi-finals because the semi-final they would be in is going to be at Bramall Lane and that would just be the icing on the cake, wouldn't it, if they made it all this way. I think there's a huge legacy piece around young girls coming, seeing their stars play in front of them. There'll be a lot of coverage on terrestrial television and we know that these big tournaments in the last few years have really pushed the women's game forward. So, yeah, to have that in, in our own country is a massive piece. I just think it's, you know, it's fantastic, isn't it? I think to, to come here today and, and to see so many young girls and boys um, just enjoying playing football and, and whether that's they want to go on and play at the professional level or, or whether that's just going having a, a kickabout with their mates, it's just great to see them sort of wanting to play the game and enjoy the games. I think. Um, and then in 1989, I moved to Doncaster and as I retired, Sue comes to Doncaster as well. So that's our seamless link. You know, there are places to go for young boys, young women to go and play football. Uh, we never had that back in the day. So the fact that the Euros are in the UK and the local to Sheffield and Rotherham is brilliant for the cities. Yeah. Thank you, 
you very much, Fran. Um, so for those of you who perhaps weren't at the roadshow or haven't seen that video, hopefully that's kind of given you a flavour of um, the run up to the Euros. Um, so really, I want to kind of start this morning's discussion by asking how significant is it for Sheffield to be a host city in, in the Euros? Um, and I'm going to come to Sarah first, actually, um, to kick off for us, no pun intended. <laughs> I always love a good pun. Um, <laughs> I think it's hugely significant. I think the, um, you know, in terms of there's so many aspects to this tournament. Obviously, we've had, we're coming up to kind of game uh, four on Tuesday. And obviously, it's going to be the big one. The Lionesses will be in Sheffield. Um, we've already seen the Dutch in Sheffield. We've seen Sweden in Sheffield. Uh, we've seen... Uh, Swiss in Sheffield and just the, the buzz that they've bought just during the kind of the month of July has been absolutely incredible and we've seen not only have we seen kind of the the resident fans kind of flying over or, or making their way over to support their teams but we've seen a lot of people the people of Sheffield also kind of claiming them as their local teams for for those those times in in this tournament and I think that's been absolutely incredible and you've seen everyone mixing together um we've said that you know in terms of kind of we're at a time now where as a country there's a lot of, there's a lot happening not only in our country but in the world that's quite fractious that that people kind of are almost pitted against each other there's there's animosity in places in politics in in laws that are happening and things that are happening across the world but for the snippet of time that you're in the fan zone and that you're in that stadium all these fans are coming together. So, you know, the, the two the two countries, the two sets of fans, they're not being split because there's going to be any ruckus. They're all sat in with each other. And you're seeing like, what well, you know, when there's a class goal being scored, you're seeing opposite fans go, that was nice. Not, not, not kind of going against each other, but really coming together. And I don't think that's just been... As I said before, it's not just the nation's fans that are doing that. I think that, you know, Sheffield have very much opened their arms to, to everyone that's ventured into the city and not only opened their arms, embraced, got involved, sat at the same table as, invited to dip, the whole shebang. It's It's been absolutely incredible. So I think on that side, in terms of that kind of cultural cohesion, seeing more people just coming in, coming together in a really happy, positive environment has been incredible. But I think the it would be remiss not to recognise all the work that's happened before that and all the work that will continue to happen beyond August 31st. So there's an incredible legacy programme that's been put in place. There's people that have worked behind the scenes to make sure that those fan zones, those fan parties have been happening. The roadshow that you saw um, happened. Um, like I say, the legacy is, is in place for coaching, volunteering, participating, refereeing. Every element of the game that you can think of has been put into a legacy programme to make sure that the women and girls and people of Sheffield benefit from this tournament. And it's it's the first time that it's happened. So the significance for Sheffield is it, it puts them on the map kind of figuratively and, and you know, in any other way, because... There's so many firsts. We've had the, the first biggest, you know, we broke the record in terms of attendance. Um, at two games now, we broke our own record, yes. which is outstanding yeah. to see. Um, you know, and in terms of other, other things that have happened behind the scenes, in terms of the amount of girls and women that are now involved in the sport, it's, it's yeah, it, it's groundbreaking and it is record-breaking. And, and we'll see the big ones that are mentioned on social media and there'll be some that you won't, hear of but you'll probably feel in 5 10 15 years time that I have that will happen then because of this right now yeah yeah I certainly got a sense going to a game in Sheffield last week between Sweden and Switzerland some of those things that you talked about in terms of there was a huge um following for Sweden and they ended up winning the match um but and I was actually supporting Switzerland so I was kind of surrounded by this like sea of yellow and blue but Actually, yeah, it was kind of um, each side cheering on, you know, good play, good goal, um, all being, you know, it was all ages, very, very friendly atmosphere. Um, and yeah, I really resonate with a lot of what you just mentioned. Um, John, I wondered if I could come to you and your kind of perspective on that same, same question, really. Yeah, well, what, what can we say? Um, 
it's just been a it's been a ball, hasn't it? It's been a carnival. It's been fantastic. And I, I'm really taken by the huge amount of work that Sheffield has put in. I, I think it's no surprise that we are leading again, that we had the opening ceremony uh, in the Peace Gardens, which we saw in that video. We've, we've, we're hosting four games. There's also four games at New York Stadium. So South Yorkshire has got a very strong representation there. Sarah mentioned all the hard work, the, the legacy program, and there is a document. I've, I've got a copy of that, Sarah. Um, you might want to share with, with people possibly uh, in the chat. I don't know if it's, if it's online, but it, it was around and I, I checked that out this morning uh, before we came into this meeting. So we, I, th I think you mentioned, Sarah, the, 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 the two records, with, attendance records, which have been broken. Those go back. You know, the, this interest in sport goes back to Victorian times and probably before that in the city. And one of the reasons why Sheffield grew so big was be, in sport and particularly in football terms was because of this interest in football uh, that, that goes way, way back and the big crowds. So we know, and we, we, Ruth Johnson will, will tell us much more, I'm sure. I'm sure she can come in and tell us, but the research they've done on her story in Football Unite Traces and Device, um, you know, there were 20,000 uh, spectators at games being played during the First World War uh, here in Sheffield. And, uh, um, gosh, where are we? Gail, um, Dick Kerr's ladies, they came, they came and played over here in Sheffield and, and played a representative game. And I think there was 25,000 or more uh, saw that game. I think it might've been at Hillsborough. Uh, Ruth will correct him. Play at Hillsborough, yeah. yeah, yeah. So just, just incredible. And I think the I I've been to three games so far. Uh, I went to the opening game at Old Trafford. I I booked in for uh, Sweden Netherlands, which was a very good game. Then I saw Sweden uh, Switzerland. Somewhere in my house, I have a flag, a Swiss flag from 1966 that was given to me by my cousin. And, and I, it was only when I got to the ground that I realized I should have brought it with me to wave, although I was a neutral. And I think Sarah talked about this. There was a, the, what I liked most about it all was everybody was together. And there was just this huge enthusiasm for football. And everybody was mixed up and everybody was chatting and there were, the number of young kids there, there was, there was a group from Barnsley sat near us uh, for one of the games. They were just cheering and shouting. They, they loved it, absolutely loved it. So I think this, it, it's just filtered down. And as Sarah said, you know, five, 10, 15 years, we're gonna see a massive difference. I think we're gonna see it next year. Uh, after all the major competitions, you see a big increase in the number of attendees, mm. in the number of uh, people engaging, uh, coaching, refereeing, uh, administering in sports. I, I'd love to see all that happen. I'd love to see women's football. Yeah, it's yeah. I, mean, I, I think, I'd, yeah, I definitely agree with you. It's not just about the impact of the, the tournament on the city. You know, there's lots of different angles, isn't there? The, the, the impact on the city and the culture and bringing out the history of football in Sheffield that actually yeah it's five ten fifteen years down the line um as we've seen with the Olympics and other major tournaments in the last few years um I just want to bring Beth in um on uh, the same question really in your perspective in terms of the significance that Sheffield the host host city yeah, totally. I mean, just to add to what Sarah and, and John have already said, um, I, I think Sheffield's been very fortunate as well to have the teams that it did in having Netherlands and Sweden, who were infamous for having a particularly, um, shall we say, vociferous uh, fan base and have brought kind of a great deal of, of fun um, to the city and really kind of showed off uh, women's football. And, and that's been reflected, obviously, in the breaking attendances and then breaking the attendances again um for a non-England a non-host nation um match which was fantastic. Um 
there are advantages for Sheffield, um, obviously economically, as there are for hosting any you know, major sport event. Um, but what I think has been more interesting for me um, is the schools programme. So there's been the opportunity, the, the UEFA round, there's been the opportunity for schools to kind of really get involved, you know, the roadshow event that you just showed that video for. Um, I think I think that that's the most impactful thing for the city in that we're still at the stage that young women and, and girls participation in football isn't a given um as it might be um for boys it, it's we're still at that stage where it very much depends on on young girls environment um so that their family their school their peers you know and, and how they're going to be influenced as to whether they might see football as a part of their future um and, and that's why it's really important to see how, how young girls and women are socialised into football and, and one sport and physical activity more generally, um, so that they see it as a valid part of their future. Um, so all the kind of legacy events that have been happening in Sheffield, as well as the matches themselves, are just so incredibly important for the young uh, women and girls in in, um, in Sheffield that they see football as a it's natural it's part of that. It's, it's an option. They don't yeah, have to. Yeah. It's, it's an option for them. And I'm just kind of reflecting from what, what people have been saying about, for me, I think there's a bit of a tension really between, I, I, I would want women's football to be presented as just football, crack on. You know, it's it's just football and it should be an, an ordinary, inevitable, you know, option for all young women. But then at the same time, there are differences. It's 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 a different product um in just not so much perhaps the way that it's played but the way it's enjoyed and the way it's experienced we're hearing a lot about that aren't we in terms of people going to women's football matches and and seeing that there's no segregation and seeing that there's you know some appreciation for the opposition playing well you know as, as we've been discussing so I think there's a bit of a tension there for me in terms of, on the one hand I want football to just be, women's football to just be football and be a routine option um but then on the other hand it, it is a different product and it doesn't need to be kind of compared or or you know kind of benchmarked in any way with men's football but um I, th I think for me that that's the impact for the young women of Sheffield that it, that women's football is being presented to them as an option um whereas Absolutely. I think it certainly yeah, wasn't they, wasn't in the past yeah they can see that opportunity and I think mm. I said it but um if you can see it you can be it or if you if you can't see it, you can't be it. Um, and, you know, and that's to the, about the visibility of the game. And actually that goes back. Mm. Like, and most importantly, perhaps just, just one thing to add to that is it's also important for young men and boys to see that that's... Yes. So, so, so yes. my, my son's, see, yeah. my son's yeah. 11 and, and he's just... The, the women's heroes to, to him, it's sort of ambivalent because it's just football and that's good. That's great. He, he's not going to, yeah. oh, the girls are playing. It's, it's just football. It, exactly and the fact that actually you know last night's England game was on big game it was on BBC One it didn't get you know it didn't get moved at 10 o'clock or whatever the news the news on. getting delayed for the it, women's the game getting delayed is, is a massive. big thing and actually yeah massive and, and there was some of that discussion just on social social media mm. last night um, which is great I want to come into the game um, more generally and some of the key points in the history of women's football so far and I want to bring in in Gale, because I know that you can't be kind of specific on Sheffield, but actually opening up, up this more widely into to where we are at now with women's football and actually how we've got here and what those key moments have been in the last 150 years or so. Um, what, what, how do you, yeah, what do you see as those key points that have got us to where we are now? Um, I think the, the key points to where we are now, for me, goes back to recent times. It, it goes back to London 2012, because that, for me, was the first time that we had a global audience for women's football. And uh, although a lot of people went because it was the Olympics and not particularly because it was football, um, that we got 70 odd thousand at Wembley when, the, when, when we played Brazil and, and stuff like that. And, it, and we were, you know, women footballers were then on the front and back pages of all national newspapers. So I think, you know, for me, that lifted us up a notch. Um, and we still need to change lots of opinions. And I think that's where history comes in because people don't realise what a rich history women's football has. But I think the, as a nation, we love a winning team. Don't matter what it is. I mean, netball, a few years ago, we were at the, was it the Commonwealth Games or something? And, and the last, 
basket or whatever you call it. I'm not, in, not into netball, but I was chuffed <laughs> a bitch that we won, you know, and I was thrilled, you know, yeah, and I was cheering up and down. And and that's how we are in this country. And I think for me, when when England women win something, and they will, it'll change things again and it will be massive and it's happening. It is for me. That's what's in my heart. That's what I feel. Um, but I still think we st we need to change some some attitudes as well. And and I like to let people know that we have a glittering past because for me, where the lionesses are now is where the Dick Curl ladies finished off in the 1920s before the, the FA banned them. Right. So obviously you research into the Dick Curl ladies and having played in the 70s, what in terms of could you feel at that point there was there was the game had places to go that it was gonna be. Did you have the feeling it was going to become as successful it is? No. Now, what, what were the kind of comparisons to today? Well, there aren't any. There aren't any comparisons. Or rather, I mean, or yeah. rather, I mean, the comparison in terms of actually what were your experiences to mm. today? How how do you think? You know, what are the key things that you think have changed where Every, we are now, apart Every, from the, uh, the Olympics? But going yeah. further, than that. further than that, yeah. Well, when I was playing. <clears throat> Some of the conditions that we had to play in were unbelievable. You know, the changing rooms. I remember one, one in particular. It was a chicken hut, an old chicken hut. And, and there was some of the, um, the boards missing at the bottom. And we had a, a rusty oil drum to go to powder our nose with, you know. And, and there were these things and pitches were up and down and, and we played in waterlogged pitches. We'd play anywhere, but nobody came to watch. You know, it was just us because we wanted to play football. Um, and that that's the thing that, that changed it for me with the Dick Curl ladies was seeing a photograph with how many people were watching them. And yet nobody were watching us. And why was that? And that's when I started ferreting around wanting to know more about them and re then discovering what a, what a huge story it was and, and what a fantastic history women's football has. And yet it lay buried for such a long time. I was going to say, do you think the fact that they were playing, and forgive me if I get anything historically incorrect here, but with the fact that they were playing when actually there was a nationwide ban on women's football, mm. is that is that really the key thing that, that changed and that there was so much interest around that team because they sort of defied the the context of the time? I think I think what, what brought people to watch them really was the charity aspect of it because all of their gamers who were raising money for charity. And and again, that's us as a nation, isn't it? We, we always dip into our own pockets to help others. And, and that's just, I think, the fabric of, of our society, really. Uh, so a lot of people came along to watch them because it was charity. But some, some gentlemen that I interviewed, you know, going back into the 90s when I first started this, and they'd seen the Dick Curl ladies play in the 20s. And I said to them, why did you go to watch the Dick Curl ladies? And they said, because I wanted to see a good game of football. There was nothing gender related or wanted to see women running around wearing shorts. They wanted to see a good game of football. And there was one guy who saw uh, the searchlight match at Deepdale in 1920. He was actually there then. And he could even still remember the captain's name because he, he thought that she was the best player on the field. And that's all those years, you know, all those years later. So... It, it, it's it, you know we we had a, we have a great history and, and we need to protect it and 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 share it with everybody and and it's a knock-on effect i i believe you know for to change opinions today because even even though there's lots of people out there now cheering um for england to win this competition there's still a lot of people that think women shouldn't be playing football and we need to change those yeah. opinions yeah yeah absolutely thank you very much gail um has anybody else got an does anybody else want to chip in in terms of key points in the history of women's football and, and add into what Gail said? I think, um, yeah, I, I'd like to add to that, you know, Gail's doing um, fantastic work in terms of uncovering that history. And as, as Gail says, um, I sometimes get a little bit irritated when, when recent women's football success can be presented as new. Like, oh my goodness, this is new, a new era. And mm. and and it, it happens within organisations as well. So, you know, when Manchester United uh, fairly recently, you know, played Manchester City, it was presented as the first ever derby. It, no, <laughs> that happened a long time ago. And it kind of self-congratulatory 
aren't we doing well? We were doing brilliantly. And, and the, the history of women's football is so turbulent and convoluted and up and down and rise and fall and rise again. Um, so I, I think it's, I'm, I'm kind of quite wary, I think, even within the current excitement of, of kind of narratives of progress, as if progress is something that happens naturally. So, you know, the, the, the women are doing well, therefore this will happen and that will happen and, you know, and women's football will evolve gradually. Um, women's football, like any sport, sports are developed by people and just sports can be held back by people as well. So we, yeah. we, we need to kind of be really, you know, wary and you know, people like Gail and, and Sarah kind of constantly pushing um, because there is still resistance out there to women's football. There are still problematic attitudes. Um, and I guess it's the challenge for all of us to, to make sure that those attitudes continue to be challenged post event you know what, what happens after the euros i, I remember can if i chip in i remember being interviewed yeah, sure. in 2005 um when the championships were in the northwest and i, I said to the reporter then you know we, girls play football every week not just once every four years mm -hmm. and we need to keep the momentum going after that because these girls I, I went after the olympics i went to watch um everton and um arsenal and there were nine Olympians on view that day and the crowd were 400 and some odd. You know, it's it's like once something's over, we, you know, we, we, we go back to our ordinary life type of thing. We've been here before, haven't we? Yeah, yeah we, need, we need to keep it going. We don't just play football once every, every four years. We're playing football every Sunday, you know, and we need to... But thankfully, that's happening now. We're seeing more and more, you know, games on the television on a weekly basis so but yeah that's, so that's i mean thing. coming to that point and you've all you've all kind of touched on um you know it, there's still work to be done in in changing attitudes and you know there are still there is still that perspective oh you know all's not for women and blah blah um what are you what do you think the things are that can change people's minds maybe um sarah if i can come to you and then john in terms of changing people's minds you know this this tournament will will play its way but i think it is the grassroots bits it's the the dad and the granddad that take daughter and granddaughter along to their first wildcats or squad session and go oh blimey this is quite good it's grandma aunt sister going and, and taking daughter or son and there being a session on in that club or in that community for them it's being able to, and I think someone alluded to it, to it earlier, to having touch points for women and girls of any age. I know that obviously kind of in terms of creating a legacy, we talk about the next generation coming through and they are incredibly important. So, you know, the young girls and young women that are out there that are either just stepping into football or are already into football or are spectating or refereeing or doing only when in one of the number of jobs or, or kind of positions or roles in football is incredible. But there are women my age, older than me, a little bit younger than me that didn't have the touch points. And actually they're going to be incredibly important in changing, in changing attitude. So as an example, uh, a group set up in Rotherham, uh, a woman got in touch with me, Caroline, saying, oh, you know, where could I, where could I go and just have a, have a bit of a kick about? And uh, I was hoping to get a session started up, up in her locality and it didn't come through. And she went and I was sort of like, well, would you be interested in sort of starting the session? She's now got 14 or 15 women turning up on a Monday night, having a kick about. And she's, you know, having a conversation with the other day. She's now like, well, and I now know a female plumber. So if I've got any problems with my taps, I'm going to give her a call. And she's now expanded her network of, of women and friends. But not only that, they went to watch the game, the first game in Rotherham her in a group and she said one of the women it was a Sunday night and, and uh one of the women I think her husband turned around and went oh what are you up to tonight she said, oh I'm going out and he went well what should I do with the kids and she's like we'll feed them and he's like well what, what about their uniforms and she's like we'll sort them out she's like I'm off I'm going to the football and I was like that that that's exactly yeah. it it's 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 flipped it's flipped from the what you might kind of be seeing as the typical gender norm to women going, well, I'm going to the football or I'm going for a kickabout. And that is going to be the bit that will change attitudes because it won't only just change attitudes to women in football. It's going to change attitudes to women 
in society. In society and that's yeah. what the and great for other thing sports about as well. Because massively actually, other sports, you know, it's not just women's football, actually. It, yeah, there's a whole range of sports that are in a similar position. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Um, John, can I bring you in on this point? And um, yeah, to, in terms of changing attitudes and um, mm. the, there's a huge the male perspective without wanting to be kind of put you in a, in a yeah, box. You, but, you're um, putting me on the spot there. And I, I sometimes <laughs> should, I, should I have a comment on this? But I do. Um, I I, mean, I, I I've got a teaching background and I was a PE teacher and I just love to see girls in school taking part in sports because I, I you might not notice it, but I, I go back a few years and, um, you know, at one time girls didn't engage with sport in quite the same way. And, uh, and even in recent years here in the city in, in Sheffield, I said, well, you know, I've been pushing and encouraging people to think about football heritage. And I, I've and this is from from some some women uh, who would say, well, you know, but, but that football is for men. Now that I've got to say that that perspective, as Sarah's pointed out, is is rapidly disappearing. I don't think it, it it'd be very hard to find now. But and I what I do love about this this engagement, the young engagement of of, of young girls and women and so on, it, it's creating that community. It's creating that growth and it's embedding it in the culture. And I'm, I mentioned culture in particular because um, I, I, some of you know that I, I put together this document for mm, yeah. encouraging football for community and arts and heritage and so on and well-being, health and well-being for Sheffield. Now, building on that, I was approached by an all, all part, the all-party parliamentary group for the North, uh, and they want me to write a, a report uh, following multiple consultations. Uh, it's called A Question of Sport, and they want to look at how sport in general and exercise can be used for leveling up. And, and when we talk about leveling up, it's building communities, it's, it's increasing participation rates, it's health and well-being, as well as the economy. But we should be using sport, and particularly football. And I, I will be writing into the report about the women's Euros and the benefits that all of the various host cities in that northern group. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's applicable across the country, but my emphasis will be about, about the north. Um, and we'll be using numerous examples. So if you've got illustrations of sport and how it's contributing, uh, you know, I, I'd very much welcome you. Just get in touch, and I'll I'll try and build that into into that report, which hopefully will prompt government to uh, to channel funding in this direction. Certainly, with the, the Conservatives coming uh, going through their leadership campaigns at the moment, quite a lot of them are talking about we need we need to we need to look at the uh, the, red, the the previous red wall constituencies and, and the north and try and level up because the whole country needs it and sport is a great way of doing that absolutely so. that sounds like a very important um, piece of work and i yeah look forward to hearing more about that and actually what that um report finds out um i should have said at the beginning so i do apologize for those that have joined the webinar and um, there will be chance to answer, ask um questions of the panel so please pop question, any questions you've got um in the chat um, and actually following on from what um, John has said, um, I know we've kind of mentioned this a little bit already, but in terms of what you think the impact will be of the Euros, both in Sheffield, but actually as a whole, and I know we've mentioned legacy and um, kind of grassroots um, sport, but are there other things that we perhaps haven't touched on yet? Um, Anybody can chip in. Yeah, Beth, let's. Um, I, I, I think it's an important junction. Um, junction is the right word, but um, we're at an important point in not only the Britain hosting the Euros, but also the new TV deal for um, club level football for WSL. That's that's phenomenally important. I mean, it's bringing money into the game that hasn't been brought. I think it's ten. I want to say ten million pounds a year. Um, is that going to be shown on? 
So, so that will be um, for Sky, but also on the BBC. Um, so, so it's, and, and that's the key element. It's not so much the finance that's important. It's that the women's football will be on free to air television um, and will really kind of increase its exposure, its visibility. Uh, and that's really crucial for any um, developing sport um, because audiences need to just kind of come across a product rather than seek it out on a subscription service. So, so for example, um, other sports, you know, for very good reason, went over to subscription services. So like rugby league and cricket, because, you know, they needed the financial input, which is understandable. Yeah. But they've suffered uh, yes. probably in terms of grassroots participation because they weren't on free to air television and they've since had to redress that. That, that's that's really important for women's football and I think we may not be able to separate perhaps the legacy of this event and also the impact of that free to wear um television deal yeah that's, that's going to be really kind of something to consider for the for the very near future because as I say I guess my, my only kind of wariness around um the ways in which we talk about legacy is that we assume <clears throat> that that a legacy will happen. So, uh, uh, Gail, we, we were discussing where were the, the 2012 Olympics, which were a fantastic event, um, but they didn't really translate, as you said, Gail, to, to club attendances because the Olympics are a very peculiar sort of event. The Olympic audience isn't really a football audience. So we, we got very excited thinking it would have an impact on what was then a very new professional league, and it didn't really. It's kind of like everyone enjoyed the event, and then it kind of slid away again. So yeah. I think that's really a important point about visibility and certainly, uh, yes, again, you know, goes for other other sports as well. Um, and, you know, some that have gone to a TV deal and then gone back to showing part of part of what they do on free to air television has had an, has had an impact and, and, and definitely um, makes a difference. Um, I think on the Olympics note, yeah, some sports will have benefited hugely from um, a home Olympics, but I agree. Yeah, but a lot of people often forget that football and sort of these mainstream sports that are sort of played the rest of the year or televised more the rest of the year um, are also part of, of that um, event. And I think when you think Olympics, football isn't necessarily <laughs> the first one that comes to mind. Um, if I can come um, to you, um, Gail, um, in terms of, yeah, because I, th I think. There's two things here. I think there's an, the immediate impact of the Euros, both in Sheffield and, and across England. Um, and then there's the longer term. Um, so I don't know whether you want to add to things we haven't already mentioned. Well, I, I think it's the visibility thing again, isn't it? If we, you know, we can still carry on showing women's football on the television and giving people the opportunity to decide whether they like it or not, rather than mm. not knowing that it's there. I mean, I've just started to going into schools to talk to some kids about the Dick Kerr ladies and the history of women's football, and they're so inspired, you know, and it's not just girls, it's boys, and and it was great to, to you know, some of the questions that these 10-year-olds are asking me were amazing. Um, so, you know, and now that's going to be a knock-on effect because I know more and more are going to want me to go and talk to their to their class or, or whatever and just tell them about these, these amazing women. So there's the visibility, uh, you know, as I, as I firmly believe and I always have, but there's also the history because that changes. Uh, yeah, and I want opinions. to come on to talking about the hair. Yeah. So let's pick up on that. Um, yeah. You know, how do we make sure that the heritage of women's football kind of is expanded and continues as part of that? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you're going into schools at the moment. Do you think there are other ways that we can, you know, because like, well, like, like Beth mentioned, women's football isn't a new thing. You know, it's yeah. got it's got a couple of centuries getting on for of history. So yeah. I think like people, places like the National Football Museum or, or other towns may have, you know, museums and things, you know, because mo most towns, Sheffield have got will have had history of women's football as, as we touched on before with John. You know, if if more um more to, like Sheffield could could say this was our team and put up some pictures in mm -hmm. the in, in the in the museum and people can go and see, oh like, wait, I didn't know that. And, and they might want to know more and think, well, no, it's not new. That, and, and what those girls did, all, all of those people back then, is no less important than what's going on now. And I know I, I used to, before lockdown, <laughs> I used to go around and do lots of talks. Uh, I used, and I would do Probus, you know, all male audiences and stuff. 
Yeah. And at the end, grown men would come to me with tears in their eyes saying, I didn't realise. I just didn't realise. And it changes their opinion. And if just one opinion is changed at every talk, then, you know, it's a pebble in a pond because they might talk to somebody else and say, hey, no, wait a minute, there's this. And, yeah. you know, it, it, for me, I'm very passionate about the Dick Hill ladies in the history, obviously because it's Preston and it's my hometown, but, but because as, as a country, no other country has what we have. This it's, had a, it's had a wider impact, hasn't mm, it? Yeah. In modern history. It's, a, it's yeah. how the, the game has... Mm -hmm. um, if I bring back in John on, on this in terms of the heritage um, and how, that, how that's continued as a result of, of the tournament, the sort of the impact of the history. <clears throat> how we capture that, maybe, or what, what the best way is to educate the next generation. Was was that directed to me? Very yes. Um, yes. Sorry, the, the a, a big truck went past the window. And oh, I the... don't worry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think I picked up most of that. The heritage is so important, and I think it's that. I, I like Gail. You know, you said put some images of the women's teams uh, in uh, in the museums and places like that, but also very upfront on websites and social media because. We've got a really good display in the library at the moment, which I encourage everyone to go and see here in Sheffield. Um, and that, I think it's that history that looking back, his, history is what happened in the past. Heritage is history with its relevance now. That's the basic definition of, of heritage. And so it's, we talk about our own personal heritages and in the same with the football. We've, we've, we've all got every city, as you pointed out, and every town and every village, and community has got a lot of this women's and girls football heritage and if you see it you know we we're seeing a change in culture we're seeing a change in perception now we're seeing this acknowledgement that it's just football almost it's you know let's go and see a game and i for me i i just think particularly with sheffield being the home of football we we should be shouting it from the rooftops and just engaging more and more people and and the, the legacy that Sarah talked about, I, I looked at it again and, you know, Sheffield's got, Sheffield, is it, it's an exemplary city across the world, I think, in terms of what it does in sport. And you, you see that, you see the, his, the, the history and the heritage, you know, I think about, um, just very briefly, um, John, John Sherwood, when I was young, John Sherwood won the, uh, he got, bronze medal in the Olympics night uh, for the hurdles mm -hmm. he inspired Sebastian Coe Sebastian Coe inspired Jessica Ennis mm -hmm. who's Jessica Ennis inspiring now it's this legacy and this heritage that we look back and as uh, I think Beth uh, no Verity you said I see and I can do yeah. And, and we need yeah, those and it's examples actually that, it's, yeah it's going from one generation to the next and mm -hmm. That kind of domino effect, isn't it? Um, Sarah, if I can bring you in on this, and just in terms of um, Sheffield and uh, yeah, it's it's heritage, and actually, yeah, what Don said in terms of those multi, you know, going back generations. How how do you think we can continue that? So? I think uh, I think realistically, kind of for the next generation, obviously, a lot of it is around its media. I mean, if we think. If we think about some of the greatest stories and especially kind of sports stories they're often turned into films they're often turned into documentaries we're seeing a lot more content now in and around women's football so the youtube channel um I, i'm never 100 percent sure how you pronounce it i think it's dazen but it's d-a-z-n um has got its chelsea women's documentary so there's kind of been the six weeks uh, six episodes of that which has been absolutely incredible um, there's been, you know, Alex Scott looking at the rise of women's football on the BBC, you know, the Dick Kerr ladies um, story and the evolution of women's football is is prime and, and ready to be made into some description of a, of a film that should be shown in in cinemas. We had Bend It Like Beckham and Bend It Like Beckham, you know, for some, you know, for a young girl like me, when I was watching it back then, I, I'd not seen, you know, um, any sort of content in and around women and girls playing football and I think I think there's also a really a really key element of, of obviously 
there's been a lot of talk in the media around how kind of white this this England team is but there is also a lot of there's a lot of culture in there for for you know Asian women and there's a lot of, of their history in there that that isn't spoken about so you know whilst it was banned in 1921 that you know those from kind of the, the underrepresented communities have found it even harder to come back or to get into the game initially, let alone to even come back into the game. And there's going to be incredible stories out there. I mean, we've we've already heard of, you know, um, Nadia Nadim in, in the Swiss team who, you know, was a refugee that, that managed to get away from... Um, apologize on my lack of knowledge but either Syria or Afghanistan and and played football in the camp and then was spotted and then settled in Switzerland and now plays for her you know that in itself she's also now a doctor um those stories we need to be realistically that will be the way that the next generation and my generation there's plenty of people in my generation that don't know the history of women's football and and just knock it for what they've seen in the last 10 years as opposed to celebrate it so I think there's there's that element now, and, and I th- you know, as Gail said, we we always love jumping on a, a winning team. And I think that will help elevate the cultural, the heritage, the history aspect of the game. Is if the lionesses come through, you know, for those people that have watched kind of um uh, the film with Denzel Washington, the the I can't remember it now, but the Titans film, and I love a good sports film, and so many people do. You know, whether it's in the next year, whether it's in the next 15 years, hopefully a catalogue of content that doesn't just tell the story of now, but tells the story of back then and now, but also tells it from different perspectives. So how, you know, again, you're Nadia Nadeem's, the the Asian women in football that are coming through and are coaching and pioneering the black women in football that have made their, you know, made their stake and their claim in the game. Those are the stories that that we need to hear and we need to hear them from such diverse people. We need to hear them so that, again, like you said about seeing it and being it, we need that. But sometimes the seeing it and being it gets you partway there, but the context push, pushes you over the line and the context is going to be important. So we need those pioneers out there in the in the kind of media industry to, to grab onto this and to push it forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and TV and film is another way to do that. And certainly, actually. Can I just tell you that, that, that my book is under option to be made into a film? Um, oh, I was, okay. I was in Manchester yesterday meeting the director, which is a, a great step forward. We haven't had a director. We've never got to this stage before. Oh, that's brilliant. Gail. So it, everything's in development as we speak. So. Oh, well, you'll have to keep us posted on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really, I'm, I'm ex- more excited now than I have been for it, because this has been going on for years, um, but yeah. now we're, we're, at, we're at a good yeah, stage. got now. a bit further with it. Yeah, yeah. so watch this space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just wanted to kind of add to Sarah's point by saying, you know, it, it is 20 years or so since Send It Like Beckham was released, whether you like that fact or not, actually, you know, a huge amount has changed in that time. Um and um yeah we need to kind of be reflecting you know what what's happening what's happening now but how we how we've got there and um, i'm just going to um check um whether we've got any um questions so far from either gareth or reed um now it's your time to speak if you if you've got a burning question for the panel no okay not at this point um so uh well really i just want to kind of pick up on um perhaps if i can ask you all what the one thing is you'll take away from this euros tournament um if i can come to you back i don't know what's the <laughs> um I, I think um I'm hopeful and confident that this has been a successful tournament already in England, at least, in terms of building the profile of the individual players. Um, I think um, we need to be hearing the stories of individual players and where they've come from, and the kind of like soap opera narratives of sport um, that, w- that we would expect. Um, 
and I think that's been um, a real positive and we're starting to see football coverage not just in terms of the match but in terms of the wider coverage so you mentioned Alex Scott's documentary for example and and like building the legacy of, of the tournament um football coverage needs to be not just the match but everything that surrounds it so kind of the end f- football is entertainment football you know getting Alex yeah. Scott on Strictly come da- dancing it, it's it's that kind yeah, of wider different avenues that different uh, avenues that can reach people it, yeah, yeah I, th- I think that's starting to happen yeah which is really good to see. Um, John, if I can come to you. I think what I'll take away is the fun, the enjoyment in the game that I really saw in the stadium and outside in the fan parks. It was just fabulous. And, and just everybody was in there. Um, and really that momentum needs to be continued. And I, I really do hope it, it, that will happen. Um, what I would love to see for Sheffield in particular is an, is an annual women's and girls competition you know, this time of year in July, possibly just into August, so that kids at school can come and come from all over Europe or all over the world to play in the home of football. I think we've got all, you know, Gareth and his team and uh, Gary Clifton and all everybody who's been involved with what's been happening in Sheffield and and all the efforts over the years, they need to be praised really highly because I think they've done a brilliant job. And if we could create an annual festival you know, with music and art and dance around football, because it's all interrelated. You could have a, an annual party here in Sheffield and, and it would be wonderful, you know. Sarah, a job for you to, to, to kick start. <laughs> That's me um, anyway. Well, I'll, I'll come to Gail and then I'll finish with Sarah, actually. So, Gail, your sort of one takeaway from this, um, these Euros, this tournament. Joy, joy and anticipation, I think, for me. It's given me a great deal of joy to see the crowd supporting women's football, given my own history. Of yeah, do you find, yeah, do you find, do you really see, you must really see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's incredible. So it's joy and it's anticipation of a future. Because I think, I, I honestly feel we're on the cusp now um, of, of turning, turning the cut on it to get back to not a level playing field, because I think women's football is special. I wouldn't like us to lose what we have. You know, you get the girls at the end of the games now, they, they, they're they interacting with fans, doing the selfies, signing, you know, it's special. And you don't get that in men's football. Um, so I wouldn't like us to lose that. But I feel, I, yeah, joy and anticipation, because I, I just feel like we're on the cusp. I really do. That's a really good way of summing it up. Thank you, Gail. And um, for you, Sarah. Yeah, I think for me, before I before I kind of came into post um, or kind of when my first initial weeks in post, I'd always said that um, kind of the thing that I was really looking forward to was a hot, sunny day in any sort of summer down a park and actually seeing groups of women and groups of girls kicking a ball about, not just boys and men, because you don't often see that. And I think the thing that I will take away is being in the fan park the other day and seeing that happen. It was girls playing headers and volleys. It was girls picking the ball up and knocking it about between themselves. And Devonshire Green was just packed with women and girls naturally thinking, oh, there's a ball, I'll have it and I'll kick it about with my mate and we'll do whatever we'll do. And that for me has been, it's such a small thing but it's game changer because if that naturally happens in our public parks and spaces, that's visibility. That's visibility is very core. Cool. Um, so if that if that transpires and moves, I mean, honestly, I, I had to I had to give myself a couple of minutes to just go go and fan myself down, and it wasn't just the heat. Yeah, that <laughs> that I mean, for everything that this tournament's done, for all the memories that we'll all take away with our families, with our friends, with our loved ones with the brand new people that we've met, with the joy that we've felt, with the things that we'll see, that is going to stick to me, stick with me for a very, very long time. Thank you very much, Sarah. That's a really positive um, note, I think, to end on. And I just want to say thank you um, to you all for a really insightful, interesting discussion this morning. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time.